As of June 2019, this regular podcast is available on our NDA Alpha Fintech Network platform. Nobel laureate Joseph Stiglitz proposes the key economic priorities in lieu of neoliberalism. Neoliberalism encompasses lower taxation, deregulation, social welfare minimalism, and less government intervention. This ideology has become the root cause of socio-economic problems such as wage stagnation, wealth inequality, market power concentration, and environmental degradation. In response, Stiglitz recommends three major economic policy prescriptions. First, the benevolent social planner should better balance free markets, civil communities, and state mechanisms. The government better shapes and facilitates markets and communities by investing in basic research, technology, education, health care, and infrastructure. This public investment pays well in terms of more connective communities and market mechanisms. Second, wealth creation arises from scientific inquiry and social organization that collectively allow people to work together for the common good. Free markets still facilitate most social cooperation but they serve this purpose only if market participants are subject to democratic checks and balances and the rule of law. Third, the government can curb corporate rent protection that may arise from information advantages, hostile takeovers, or other entry barriers. The government has to sever the nexus between market power and political influence. A public investment reform should thus focus on higher education, research, technology, affordable health care, and infrastructure. Berkeley tax economists Gabriel Zuman and Emmanuel Cease find fresh insights into wealth inequality in America. Their latest estimates show that the top 0.1% of U.S. taxpayers control 20% of American wealth. This result represents the highest share since 1929. The top 1% of U.S. taxpayers control 39% of American wealth, whereas, The bottom 90% of U.S. taxpayers control 26% of American wealth. In contrast, the bottom half of Americans collectively have a negative net worth, that is total liabilities exceed total assets. Zuman further finds that multinational corporations move 40% of their $600 billion offshore profits out of high-tax countries into lower-tax jurisdictions. With their empirical results, Seize and summon champion bold and aggressive tax policy recommendations. For instance, Senator Elizabeth Warren proposes a wealth tax that would bring in $2.8 trillion over the next decade. Warren confers with Seize and summon again before she floats a corporate tax on net profits above $100 million. This tax may raise $1 trillion over 10 years. Also, New York Congressional Rep. Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez proposes to hike the top marginal tax rate for Americans who earn annual income above $10 million. The seize some and empirical results lend credence to these bold tax policy proposals. Investing in stocks is the best way for most people to become self-made millionaires. A recent Gallup poll indicates that only 37% of young Americans below the age of 36 own stocks whereas, 61% of Americans over the age of 35 own stocks in the same time window from 2017 to 2019. This evidence suggests that most Americans fail to leverage the stock market as a worthy investment vehicle. The magical power of compound interest exponentially contributes to personal wealth accumulation. For instance, If a young investor saves $100 per week to earn an 11% stock market average return each year, he or she can receive more than $1.2 million after 30 years. This financial discipline requires automatic money transfers on a periodic basis. In other words, most people can consistently invest a small amount of money with great discipline to reap exponential cash rewards at retirement age. Moreover, These wise investors can smooth out most extreme stock price gyrations by waiting patiently to accrue compound interest on regular stock investments. As compound interest snowballs into greater dollar amounts of stock bets, both principal and interest payments roll over and become substantial lump sums after a sufficiently long time span. 
the financial crisis of 2008 to 2009 affects many millennials as they now face the major costs of college tuition, residential demand, health care, and child care. Ages 22 to 39, millennials have less purchasing power than previous generations did at the same age. Although millennials have benefited from a 67% increase in real wages since the 1970s, this wage boost is insufficient for millennials to keep up with price inflation over the past four decades. More than half of millennials cannot afford to own residential properties, have less than $5,000 in their bank deposit accounts, and maintain no retirement accounts. Nowadays millennial affordability attracts both public and private solutions. For instance, Senator Elizabeth Warren proposes that the government forgives $50,000 in student loan debt for every American whose family makes up to $100,000. Also, former Vice President Joe Biden supports the new proposal that it should be free for students to complete four-year bachelor degrees at public universities. Moreover, the venture fund Keros invests in more than five companies with $20 million to design solutions that tackle the inflationary costs of student loan debt, residential demand, childcare, and health insurance. Overall, millennial affordability has hence become a major socioeconomic issue in America. Amazon and Google face comprehensive antitrust scrutiny. In recent times, Justice Department and Federal Trade Commission have reached an agreement to conduct independent investigations into these tech titans. Justice Department takes responsibility for Google and eTrust matters, whereas, Federal Trade Commission handles Amazon in light of potential consumer harm. This internal agreement presages intense antitrust scrutiny. Google already faces antitrust fines in Europe due to the EU charges that the online search algorithms favor Google-driven software products. U.S. antitrust law focuses on the broader notion of consumer protection, however, smart algorithms help constrain Amazon retail price hikes. Federal Trade Commission conveys concern and suspicion that the sheer size and market power of Amazon may induce anti-competitive effects. Limiting the market power of tech titans may be one of the few policy domains where both Republicans and Democrats can find common cause. Democratic presidential candidates such as Joe Biden, Bernie Sanders, and Elizabeth Warren call for greater antitrust scrutiny on the campaign trail. Also, President Trump and other Republicans accuse Amazon and Google of political bias. Justice Department and Federal Trade Commission either stimulate greater competition in e-commerce and internet search, or the regulatory agencies may consider breaking up Amazon and Google. San Francisco Fed CEO Mary Daly suggests that trade escalation is not the only risk in the global economy. Due to the current Sino-US trade tension, the global economy seems to slow down quite a bit. Several other global economic issues need resolution too. For instance, Halloween Brexit may result in negative consequences for Eurozone trade and financial capital exodus. Daly indicates that the U.S. economy may experience unforeseen challenges if business sentiment and economic data get out of sync. If business sentiment turns out to be negative, this pervasive negativity may become a self-fulfilling prophecy that can lead to significant fluctuations in real economic output. Nevertheless, Daly reiterates that the U.S. economy operates near the long-term efficient level with 3.6% to 3.7% unemployment as inflation rises toward the 2% target. In the current macroeconomic scenario, the federal funds rate remains neutral. This outcome accords with the Federal Reserve dual mandate of price stability and maximum sustainable employment. The recent interest rate hikes help dampen extreme asset price gyrations and so contribute to financial market stabilization. At any rate, Daly emphasizes that it is important for the Federal Reserve to remain patient before the FOMC members consider the next interest rate adjustments. To secure a better trade arrangements with the European Union, Jeremy Corbyn encourages Labour legislators to back a second referendum on Brexit. In recent times, Theresa May has indicated her intention to resign as British Prime Minister, and the European election results shine fresh light on a second referendum on Brexit. Nigel Farage, his Brexit party, 
and conservative Brexit supporters are likely to fight hard against Corbyn-led Labour legislators. Labour Party now has a strategic advantage if Corbyn and his fellow MPs pivot in favour of a second referendum on Brexit. As the European Union remains the largest trade bloc to Britain, Britons must reconsider the economic pros and cons of closer trade ties with the Eurozone. The Brexit withdrawal agreement may involve a gross amount of €100 billion. Euros. Net of some UK assets, the final bill would involve about €65 billion. Euros. The withdrawal transfer funds can contribute to better British health care, social welfare, infrastructure, taxation, and other aspects of public finance. However, Britons use the British pound but not the euro, so the UK has never been part of the EU Monetary Union. British millennials prefer to remain in the EU for closer trade ties and better economic arrangements. The Sino-American trade war may slash global GDP by $600 billion. If the Trump administration imposes tariffs on all Chinese imports and China retaliates with countermeasures, the global stock market may decline by 10%. In this worst-case scenario, Bloomberg expects global GDP to fall 0.6% or $600 billion by mid-2021. The same simulation suggests that both U.S. and Chinese economic output may decline by 0.7% to 1%. Several countries such as Canada and Europe rely heavily on Sino-American trade and so may suffer as a result. In terms of better balancing the bilateral trade deficit, this deficit has indeed declined from $91 billion to $80 billion from 2018-Q1 to 2019-Q1, as the Trump tariffs come into effect. Also, the current U.S. CPI inflation hovers in the range of 1.6% to 1.9%, still below the 2% target level. This fact defies the Chinese allegation that the Trump tariffs may substantially raise the Chinese import prices with substantial inflationary pressure. U.S. retail sales growth continues to slow down although American consumer confidence rebounds in early 2019 due to higher wages and tight labor market conditions. The recent 8% renminbi devaluation coincides with the 25% Chinese stock market plunge and less foreign direct investment. The Chinese Xi administration may leverage its state dominance of rare earth elements to better balance the current Sino-American trade war. In recent times, President Xi visits a giant Xi hardware factory that spins rare earth elements into permanent magnets in iPhones, electric cars, wind turbines, and military missiles. China monopolizes 80% of the strenuous extraction of 17 vital rare earth elements for ubiquitous applications from consumer electronic technology to national defense. Although the ores are as common as copper and lead, rare earth ores oxidize quickly and their extraction can cause severe pollution. With its low labor costs and lax environmental regulations, China has become the dominant force in the rare earth market since the 1980s. With almost half of global rare earth deposits, China produces 120,000 metric tons of rare earth per annum, or about 80% of the global supply. Australia is the second largest supplier of only 20,000 metric tons of rare earth per year. The Chinese Xi administration has a strategic incentive to reduce the quota of rare earth elements from 60,000 tons for better environmental protection. The next quota reset is due in June 2019 and this reset can indicate whether China intends to leverage its rare earth quasi-monopoly to counteract the Trump tariff tactic. Dallas Federal Reserve President Robert Kaplan expects the U.S. economy to grow at 2.25% to 2.5% in 2019 to 2020 as inflation rises a bit. In an interview with Fox Business Network, Kaplan indicates that it might be too soon to gauge the ripple effects of U.S. tariffs on Chinese and European imports, greenback fluctuations, and inflationary concerns. As the Federal Reserve remains patient on the next monetary policy adjustments, independent and credible central bank communication can help circumvent financial imbalances in the U.S. real economy. Meanwhile, the China-U.S. trade tension intensifies, so many stock market analysts now consider low inflation to be transitory. Federal Reserve balance sheet shrinkage continues, 
but some stock market analysts expect this balance sheet strategy to halt in light of higher treasury yields. These higher treasury yields may inadvertently tighten credit conditions for most mortgage borrowers and corporate debtors. In this negative light, this rationale leads to financial imbalances in the form of exorbitant mortgage and business debt. In turn, these financial imbalances exacerbate the current real estate and business debt dilemma. When push comes to shove, monetary policymakers need to consider the potential ramifications of credit supply shortage before the Federal Reserve steers the next interest rate adjustments. St. Louis Federal Reserve President James Bullard indicates that his ideal baseline scenario remains a mutually beneficial China-U.S. trade deal. Bullard indicates that the Chinese Xi administration should accept U.S. demands on trade deficit curtailment and intellectual property protection and enforcement in order to attract more foreign capital investments as the Oriental country can reap enormous benefits. In the baseline scenario of a major Sino-U.S. trade deal, the Trump tariffs may linger such that the Federal Reserve has to address the likely U.S. economic growth concerns. Since the U.S. and China cannot conclude their year-long trade conflict, this economic policy uncertainty stokes fresh worries about the global economy. U.S. FOMC members agree that their current patient monetary policy approach can remain in place for some time. In this positive light, the Federal Reserve halts the next interest rate hikes as Fed governors jawbone their implicit expectations of anchoring both U.S. economic growth and interest rates at 2.25% to 2.5%. To the extent that inflation risk remains low or slightly below the 2% target level, the Federal Reserve keeps intact the 2.5% federal funds rate as the U.S. economy operates near full employment with a 3.6% to 3.7% unemployment rate. Patience pays well in time. The world seeks to reduce medicine prices and other health care costs to better regulate big pharma. The Trump administration now requires pharmaceutical companies to disclose medicine prices in U.S. television ads. Proponents support more transparent disclosures of medicine prices and other health care costs. However, some other industry groups argue that astronomical medicine prices may discourage patients because many specialty medications are not so affordable. In recent times, the World Health Organization WHO, discusses universal health care, antimicrobial resistance, and the impact of climate change on global health etc. A major topic pertains to the high prices of new specialty medicines. For instance, the immuno-oncology medicine Keytruda costs $13,600 per month for continual cancer treatment. Also, the specialty medicine for cystic fibrosis, or CAMBI, costs $23,000 per month. In America, many diabetics die primarily due to the high costs of insulin. The Trump administration encourages multinational big pharma firms to reduce medicine prices in the U.S. with healthy price hikes elsewhere whereas, high health care costs in general, and astronomical specialty medicine prices in particular, remain a widespread problem worldwide. On balance, the government should enforce medicine price reductions to help enrich the economic lives of patients around the world. Fed Chair Jerome Powell suggests that the recent surge in U.S. business debt poses moderate risks to the economy. Many corporate treasuries now carry about 40% debt as part of equity market valuation. St. Louis Federal Reserve Bank recent data indicate that the corporate debt to EBITDA ratio has risen to the upper range of 2.3x to 3.1x. Powell warns that the current level of business debt can cause financial stress to borrowers if the U.S. economy weakens. However, Powell adds the cautionary caveat that business debt may not present imminent risks to U.S. financial system stability, household consumption, and business growth. As the Federal Reserve continues to assess the potential amplification of business debt deterioration, short-term liquidity risk remains moderate in the U.S. financial system. Meanwhile, the Trump administration seeks to raise fiscal deficits to support ambitious public programs on infrastructure, education, residential estate, health care, and social security. This public debt accumulation may crowd out intertemporal business debt capacity at the margin.
If the U.S. total debt capacity remains invariant over time, the government either has to tolerate higher inflation in the form of seigniorage taxes, or needs to consider the ripple effects of incremental corporate debt on the real economy. The Sino-U.S. trade war may be the Thucydides strap or a clash of Caucasian and non-Caucasian civilizations. The proverbial Thucydides strap refers to the historical fact that the dominant superpowers may experience inevitable economic sanctions or even military confrontations as these countries become more powerful in the world. The current Sino-U.S. trade conflict may lead to the self-fulfilling prophecy that the incumbent superpower fights fears of losing global dominance by precipitating a tit-for-tat trade war against its most plausible challenger. In accordance with what Harvard political scientist Samuel Huntington suggests, these dominant superpowers may inadvertently go through the clash of civilizations. In the current Sino-U.S. trade war, China and the U.S. may have fallen into the Thucydides strap or an aggressive clash of Chinese and Caucasian civilizations. The Trump administration advocates America first trade protectionism with ubiquitous domestic populist support, whereas, the Chinese Xi administration calls for free markets and open trade flows. U.S. trade regulators should help curtail the imminent Chinese threat to global institutions such as WTO rules and other fair trade practices. The Trump administration must demonstrate that a higher moral purpose motivates U.S. protectionist trade policies if the Trump team intends to garner wider international support. Top tech firms such as Google, Intel, and Qualcomm suspend their Android hardware and software services to Huawei as the Trump administration blacklists the Chinese company. Huawei can no longer license the complete Android operating system with tech services from Google, Intel, and Qualcomm. Stock market analysts suggest that this hurdle hits half of Huawei smartphone shipments worldwide. Soon after President Trump issues an executive order on blacklisting Huawei in America, Google suspends Android updates for the second biggest handset manufacturer. U.S. microchip makers Intel and Qualcomm also cut off Huawei. These strategic moves can cause serious ramifications for the Chinese tech titan because the new ban blocks Huawei from Android software updates and apps that normally preload on Huawei mobile devices sold around the world. As the Trump administration blacklists Huawei, this ban speeds up digital isolation for China amid Sino-U.S. trade war and economic policy uncertainty. If China and the U.S. have begun a technological cold war in recent times, the Huawei ban can best be viewed as the dawn of a digital iron curtain. The current 90-day reprieve may be a tactical solution for Trump to urge the Chinese Xi administration to affirm a fair trade agreement.